so good to see each and every one of you. We're glad that you're here. We are starting a brand new series. It's always good to be here at the beginning of something. Isn't it good to be here at the beginning of something? Look at somebody next to you and say, this is going to be fantastic. Go ahead and tell them. It's going to be fantastic. We've been waiting a long time putting some pieces together for this particular series. And let me kind of give you an overview. We're starting a series called Rooms. On the count of three, you need everybody to say rooms. One, two, three. And rooms is all about the different rooms in your house. And we are going to use the different rooms in the house as kind of a springboard, a, a, a launching pad for discussion biblically about the family. Now, you may uh, automatically say, yes, I want to talk about those. Or you may say, no, I don't want you meddling in my family. Or maybe you say, I'm a family of one right now. That's okay. This is for everybody. Everybody say everybody. It is for everybody, but what we're going to be doing is setting a foundation biblically by walking through these different rooms, and we're going to take a different room of the house each week, and uh, our goal is, by God's standards in his own word, to turn our houses into homes, to make sure that we have places that if, uh, if we were to look back on our house, that our priorities are right, that our values were right that our actions were right, and that, that not in the day right now, but if, if we do this right, that we will set up a framework so that in 20 years we'll look back and we'll say, thank God we did it that way. Because most of the time when we look back, it's not usually thank God we did it that way, right? Most of the time when we look back on our life, it's what were we thinking? I can't believe we survived that. Well, we want to preempt that, and we want to move in this direction. And I know that we can learn from one another as well, because there are some families in here that have done a bang-up job, that God has taught them lessons, and we can learn from them. There are some things that we want to learn that, uh, that we can be told instead of have to experience. They call that paying the dumb tax. Have you ever paid the dumb tax? I mean, you were dumb, so you paid that tax. Wouldn't it be nice if somebody next to you already paid that tax for you? Wouldn't that be nice? Look at somebody near you and say, you better have paid. Go ahead and tell them. Yeah, you better have paid. Paid that dumb tax for you. This last week was a, a good experience. We had a lot of hard work. Our volunteers, I'm blown away every week by the, the volunteers around Crosspoint. At this campus, at every campus, we had an amazing concert here uh, with Lincoln Brewster. Uh, and I didn't do anything. I did nothing. I did zip. I just showed up and enjoyed the concert. I mean, they, everybody did such a great job. And my wife and I, we got here, and uh, the boys went and sat with their friends. And we sat back up in the balcony up there. And when we sat down, I'd only been there for a couple of minutes, and uh, a little guy, I mean little guy, knee-high guy, came up to me with big old eyes. He goes, are you Andy? <laughs> well, like, yeah, and I got a fist bump from him, and his, his sisters followed, and, and we had a good time, and mom was there. She said, okay, but yeah, absolutely. And we talked for a little bit and, and, and gave high fives and talked about the concert and, and, and how much fun he was having, and, and then uh, they all went back down. Well, about a minute later, he came back up holding his little pop bottle said, can I sit by you? <laughs> now, I got to tell you, that'll warm your heart right away, won't it? So he sat down next to me, and, and I started talking to him, and he was just a happy guy, you know what I'm talking about? Had a, and he had questions about everything. Y'all know that age? You know what I'm talking about? Something to say about everything that was going on, and he was sitting next to me, and, and I remember he dropped a couple of bombs on me. As he was sitting next to me, this little guy just dropped a couple of bombs on me, a little tanner. He said, I can't wait to go to school. Now, that's a bomb because I'm raising teenagers, amen? He said, I can't wait to go to school. I go, really? Can't wait to go to school? Where are you going to go to school? He goes, we're homeschool. That was the second bomb. I'm like, well, great googly moogly, homeschool high five right there. <laughs> Did y'all get that? Never mind. <laughs> and then he said, I said, what do you want to learn at school? He said, I want to learn to be a cab over truck driver. And in that statement, here's what I heard. I heard that there is a little boy who's living in a home who loves his mama so much he can't wait for her to be his teacher so that he can grow up and be like his daddy. That's a home worth growing up in, amen? And we want to we wanna make sure that we don't just have houses, that we have homes, and, and that we are living in such a way that, that the children that we're raising, the friends that we have, the spouses that we live with, that we would step back and take an honest check of how we're living and who we're affecting by the decisions that we make and the way that we live our life. So that's the journey. We're going to be looking at different rooms of the house, and this week we're going to be walking through what I arguably can say is the most important room in the house. The kitchen. How many would agree with me? The kitchen is the most important room in the house. Because if somebody comes to your house and they stand on the front porch, that means you don't know them. 
If you let them in your living room, you know them a little, but if you hang out in the kitchen, you're friends, right? <laughs> and if you've been around long enough, you know that I have something called refrigerator rights. And that means if I'm talking to you and you feel comfortable just walking over and making your own sandwich, we're real good friends. That's refrigerator rights. So in order for us to illustrate this, I told my wife, I said, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show a couple pictures of our kitchen. And she looked at me like, what? <laughs> so uh, let, let me walk you through. I want to I introduce you to, uh, to our kitchen. Here we go. Maybe. There we go. My wife has brightly colored our kitchen. She has redecorated it mm, three or four times since we've lived there. And it's like everybody else's kitchen. Oh, wait, don't get ahead of me. Here's the fridge. And uh, the fridge is covered with uh, some pictures and some school schedules, usually mostly out-of-date stuff. Uh, let me show you the next one. Um, this is inside the fridge. Kathy was a little skeptical that I should show you this, but now hold this picture here for a minute because when we talk about this, when I say we're going to look at the kitchen... The theme for this message this weekend is what are you feeding your family? Because what you're feeding your family is important. So let's just take a little look at what we got going on here. Um, if you look real close, we got some leftovers on the top shelf. That's always a God blessing right there anytime there's leftovers. I, I don't even care what they are. My favorite food is leftovers. Do I have any other men in the house with me? Very good. All, all it requires is a microwave. Um, yeah, down, there's a bag down there on the second shelf. That's cauliflower. Shows how healthy we are right there. That's right. Uh, up on the top shelf, oh, that's silk almond milk. Now, you know we're trying to do good work when we got silk almond milk. But, but if you look closely, let me zoom in just a little bit more. We got one more picture. I don't know if you can see that. Behind the silk milk there, you see? Is that bothersome to anybody else? <laughs> There's a can of bug spray in the fridge. <laughs> oh, okay, I planted that there. My wife would kill me if I didn't tell you that. I, I put that in. How many of you, if you opened your fridge up, you'd see all kinds of stuff, but if you saw a can of bug spray, if you saw a can of poison, you're like, say what? There should not be poison in the fridge. Can I get an amen in the house? Let me try that one more time because I don't feel the love enough. There should not be poison in the fridge, Amen. Because you mean like late, late at night, you're like, oh, I'm going to get me some ice cream. Two o'clock in the morning, you're kind of sleeping, Shh, spray that down. No, no, no. <laughs> you don't make that mistake. No poison in the fridge. What I'm getting at is that I believe that we don't even realize it. But that when we let our families conform to the pattern of this world, when we let our families conform to the image of this place, that we are often feeding our families poison. We don't know it. We don't see it. And so I'm asking you to take a biblical look and say, as we look at the kitchen, what are we feeding our families? What are we letting them feed upon it? And are we giving them good things to help them grow? Are we giving them things that are healthy for them? Or are we poisoning them slowly because we're letting some things in that God doesn't want in? Our fridge. What are you feeding your family? Now, let me make sure we understand where we're going because I know most of us in this room go, no, I'd never do that. I have a series of questions for you just to ponder. And the questions are this. In your house, what gets talked up and what's get, what gets talked down? See, because I'm not talking about the food that you eat. If that was a lesson, we'd need somebody else to teach it. Can I get an amen? <laughs> I'm talking about what we put into our lives. When you talk something up, whenever you, listen, I, I need you to hear me on this. People think all the time that things are passed down generationally. But I want you to know something. Looks are passed down generationally. Physique is passed down generationally. Behavior is not passed down generationally. Behavior is taught. And if you have an angry young man, that's coming out of an angry house. And if you have a snotty young woman, that's coming out of a snotty house. Not getting any amens, but I am getting some nods because you're just afraid of who's sitting next to you right now. I understand. <laughs> and what I'm getting at is that we are feeding our family, and, and they may look like you, but the only reason they act like you, you, you say, well, I know whole families, and they're all Olympic athletes. Well, guess what? In that house, they train to be Olympic athletes. They say, you don't come out of the womb doing a 100-yard dash, Amen. I mean, you, you, you have to get, th th there's a certain amount that you receive, but we become what we become because of what we're taught. What gets talked up? What gets talked down? Let me give you another question. What gets rewarded and what gets disciplined? In your house, you're telling your family, your spouse, your friends, your in-laws what's important by what gets rewarded and what gets disciplined. One more. 
What gets attention and what gets ignored? What gets attention and what gets ignored? When our boys were real little, and I've got to tell you straight out the shoot, that uh, my family has, it's been a joy to raise Noah and Nathan. Uh, they're teenage boys, 16 and 14. I can still say that today. I realize that the, the problems that we have as parents uh, with them, I, I understand. They're good boys. We, we just don't have a significant amount of problems. But, but they were siblings. They are siblings. And, and so we have a little bit of confrontation. I remember when Noah was just real little, he was only old enough to know a few words, and Nathan didn't know almost anything. But Nathan was always in his business. They're only two and a half years apart. And I remember Noah coming in one day, Kathy about cracked up. He came in and went, Nathan is ruining my life. <laughs> well, how is he ruining your life? And, and we went through that process and, and Nathan was just kind of in his business all the time and, and we would discipline him, but it didn't seem to do any good. So we were living far from home. We didn't have any friends or family in the area. So we were actually at Nathan's physical as a little guy and said, can you help us with this? I mean, how do, how do we get him to behave? And the doctor was so wise. He goes, let me, let me ask you, how do, how do you do that? And we told him what we were doing. We're disciplined, time out. We give him a swat on the rear. Yes, call me in if you need to. It was on the diaper. And, and he says, try this. Instead of disciplining him, reward him. Every time he does something you don't want him to do, tell Noah how great he is. We're like, all right. And we took that home. That worked like a champ. I mean, every time Nathan would be lipping off or doing something, we'd go, Noah, thank you for being such a kind gentleman. And Nathan would be like, I want to be a kind gentleman. <laughs> and all of a sudden, the value system started to shift. You see, what you talk about or don't talk about, what you value or don't value, what you pay attention to or you ignore, what you reward and what you discipline, I'm going to ask you a question. What are you feeding your family? Because very often we're feeding them things that are taking them the wrong direction. Can I get an amen in the house? Right. Now, we're going to be challenged by this. I'm going to ask you to step outside and uh, look at your family, look at your kitchen from that kind of perspective. But let me pray for us, then we're going to jump into the text. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to be in your word. And I pray that for the next few minutes, you would help us to, uh, to see with your eyes. God, we want to be able to look back on our families and be thankful and grateful for the good years that we poured into our kids, that we poured into our marriage, that we did what we needed to do. But God, we need your wisdom. We've already proven we can't do this on our own. We can't be happy in our marriage without you. We can't be wise in our parenting without you. We can't be fulfilled in our life without you. So right now we ask that you would speak through this broken pastor. I'm admitting my frailty, and if your Holy Spirit does not come through beyond me, we're all at a loss. I pray that you would come through our broken ears because we can't even hear correctly if you don't help us to do that. God, may your word heal me. God, I'm praying right now. I'm asking, would you heal cold marriages? Would you turn up the heat and make them fiery hot for you again? God, would you invigorate parents? Would you break the bonds of rebellion over teenagers? Would, would you infuse your glory in the homes? And may we begin to live and feed upon the things you want us to feed upon. And may nothing ever be the same. It's in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ that we pray. And all God's people said, amen, amen. Take your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 6. It is a familiar passage, but one in which if we will apply it to the family, and again the context of the kitchen, what are you feeding your family, I think it's going to give us some, uh, some new insight. Matthew chapter 6, I love it because it's the words of red. And if you don't know what that means, when the words are in red, that means Jesus said this stuff, so it makes me very happy. Here we go. In Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 25, it says, therefore I tell you, Am I really loud to you right now? I feel really loud. It's all in my head. Maybe my ears are clean now. Here we go. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life. And why are you anxious about clothing? And why are you anxious about clothing? And why are you anxious? I'm sorry, I like that line so much. Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. 
They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his, gl- in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? Oh, you of little faith. Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat, or where shall we, uh, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows. Everybody say knows. Your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first his kingdom, the kingdom of God, and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious for tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Now in this, this is a reprioritization. Jesus holds a standard up to every life and every family and says, this is how you should set your priorities. This is how you should value things. These are the things you should talk up and these are the things you should talk down. These are the things you need to reward and these are the things you need to discipline. And if we will do things God's way, I'm gonna need an amen when I'm done with this. If we will do things God's way, we will get some stuff done. Now, the problem is we're going to push back. I'm going to tell you right now, before we go any further, you're going to push back. You're going to hear some stuff going, yeah, that was for another day. Well, that's true, but don't ever do that to God. God's word is true with no contraction or conjunction at the end of that statement. It's always true. If we believe that, then we need to accept this. And here's the first blank I need you to fill in. When it comes to what we're feeding our family, we need to know, according to God's word, it's not about things. It's not about things. It's not about stuff. Uh, it'll go up on the slides here in just a second. It's not about things. It's not about stuff. It's, it, it's not about what you can acquire. Here's what it says in Matthew 6, verse 25. Let me read it to you one more time. It says, therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you eat or what you drink or about your body, what you will put on. Here's the question. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Isn't that a great question? I'm going to ask it one more time. Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothing? I'm not getting a strong enough answer. We must be a bunch of Americans because we're all thinking about where we're going to go eat and whether our clothes will fit tomorrow. (laughs) Is life not more important than food? Is the body not more important than the clothes you put on it? See, it says, don't be anxious about that. Don't don't worry about those things. This is not what life is about, that that we get in trouble when we start worrying about stuff and things, and when we start talking them up, and we're worried about it, we're fretting about this and and this and that, and the problem is, I can say that till I am blue, and I can keep preaching till I keel over right here, and 99% of us are going to walk out unchanged because we have bought into the system of this world, which says that a good God-fearing American is going to have two and a half uh, bathroom house with a, uh, an SUV and 3.5 kids that, that we've got this, this model and, and I got news for you. God has not intended everybody to have the same stuff. God has not valued everybody to, to acquire the same things. That everything that we need is found in Christ and in Christ alone. And when we get caught up in that other game, listen, we play this more, 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 more. Let, let me give you an example. Who in here loves? Now don't you lie, you're in church. Who in here loves a good pizza buffet? Oh my goodness. It doesn't even matter what kind. I don't even have to give a name, do I? Just pizza buffet? Sure, I'm in. That's good. It's cardboard pizza. I don't care. It's free. And a lot of it. Let's get let's get it going. I, I can use that. We love the pizza buffet. Well, when we were on uh, spring break vacation a couple weeks ago, we were camping. We drove into Cheney one day. And there was a bowling alley, and we were just going to bowl one afternoon when it was a little rainy outside, because we didn't want to be outside, so we found something to do. And lo and behold, when we got in there, they had a pizza buffet at a bowling alley. Beulah land, I'm longing for... I mean, that was heaven right there. I mean, you walk in, there's bowling and pizza buffet. It was great. They said, would you enjoy the pizza buffet? Uh, Yes, we'll enjoy the pizza buffet. Put it on there. We're, you know, swipe the card. I'm good. Now, my vision of a pizza buffet, I I I hate to even say this is that I walk along and I just like to sample everything. I like at least one of everything. And it's horrible. It's, it's bad. But, but I like, and dessert pizza, amen. Can we just have a moment for dessert pizza right there? <laughs> that wasn't even a thing five years ago. And now there's, we've all got our favorite kind of dessert pizza. So anyway, we said yes. And they said, the, the, the line's over there. Just go over there. Now, they have done something genius at the Chini Pizza and Bowl. Because you go over there to the pizza buffet and you're not allowed to touch the pizzas. You have to look across at the athletic 17-year-old who is serving you the pizzas. And you have to tell him and his skinny old self what you want. 
And with your empty plate, you go, I'd like one of those. And one of those. And by the time you're almost ready to say the third, he's looking at you like. <laughs> and you walk back to your table with two pieces of pizza. Now, I got smart. I went back the next time. I, I need one of those. And my wife wants two of those. <laughs> Here's, I'd never eaten so little at a pizza buffet in my life. Because there was a monitor on the other side. You know what I'm telling you right now? Church, you need a monitor. You need to understand that we are caught in a cycle. That we are caught. we got to have a bigger house. We've got to have a bigger budget. We need more time off. We need a grander vacation. We need better pictures to post on Facebook so people know that we're doing well. I need newer duds. I need more of this. And when we talk about it, when we value it, when we stay in that cycle, you know what? When you keep going, if you get a raise and you can get more, guess what? You've just affirmed to your family that this is the right direction. Not a single amen. But if you come to the place where you say, hey, here's what we're going to do this year. We're going to cut back because we're going to give to God's work. We're going to cut back because there are people in need. We're going to start living. Then we start. We start communicating what's of real value. And I don't know what you need to do. I'm not, I'm not in your house. If God said something in your heart right there, that's between you and him. I, I'm just giving some overarching statements. But here's what I do know. He is quite clear. When it comes to life, life ain't about stuff. It's not about stuff. Look at somebody near you say, it ain't about stuff. Next. You know what some of you are saying? But I ain't got enough stuff. People around me got more stuff. Guess what? Everybody, everywhere you go, somebody's got more stuff than you. Somebody's got less stuff than you. The question that you have to answer is, am I going to learn to be content with the God stuff in my life? Second, it's not about things. And it's not about performance. It's not about performance. This one's tough in our culture. Let me show you where I get that from. It's from verse 26. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. And yet your heavenly, and yet, everybody say, and yet. And yet your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not more of more value than they? There's another question. You look at a sparrow. Are you not of more value than they? I need some help. Are you not of more value than they? I got, I got news for you. Some of you may be bird lovers, but you're more valuable than a bird. You're, I got a good bird story. Can I tell you a bird story? I used to be in a Christian rock band, had long hair down to my waist, played bass. Mm, we thought we were going to make it, right? It, it was really embarrassing. Let me tell you more. I looked like Billy Ray Cyrus on steroids. It was horrible. <laughs> but we had, a, we, had, we had a gig in um, Trinidad, Colorado. Anybody ever been to Trinidad, Colorado? Uh, and you had to go way out. There, there was this long stretch of road. It's like one of the longest stretches of road with no shoulders, no intersections, no anything for miles and miles and miles. And we hit it about four o'clock in the morning. I mean, we've been driving all night, just, oh, so tired. And I'm, I'm driving my wife's Geo Metro. And we're just, we're motoring down the road. And, you know, you just pray for God to wake you up. You ever just pray, hit yourself in the thigh? You know, oh, God, wake up, in, open the window, just, ah, oh, whatever you got to do. And you scream around, like, ah, you know, just try to, anybody with me on this, trying to stay awake? God was so good to me. We're, we're just driving down the road. And just out of nowhere, this big, black, ubiquitous crow goes, and hit the front of our car. And it hit, and it went, and it just shot right up off the top. And for, I was like, oh, I'm awake. I'm awake. And I remember looking in the rearview mirror, and that bird, man, I killed it dead. Because it, it came straight down out of the sky and just landed on the windshield of the van, carrying all the band stuff behind us. And I remember watching, like that. And I'm laughing. It's before cell phones. So I couldn't even tell them how funny it was. Well, it took us a long time. We got to the end of that road. We all stopped to get gas, and I had kind of forgotten about that. And I walk around the corner, and Mark is in another part of the convenience store, and he's telling the story. Man, it was crazy. It's like this bird had a heart attack, fell right out of the sky. <laughs> I didn't tell him. <laughs> really? <laughs> do you know what that has to do with this? Nothing. <laughs> what I'm getting at, I can't even connect it. Birds aren't worth anything. <laughs> they're, not, they're not. 
compared to you, that is. Here's what God's word says. The, the, the birds, they don't even sow and they don't even reap, and yet God takes care of them. And you are so much more invaluable than that. The, the birds don't, they, they don't perform, but God still takes care of them. Here's the problem. You and I have been caught in a cycle that we think not only do we have to get stuff, but we have to perform. God says it's not about that. That if you didn't have any abilities, if you didn't have any energies, the God of the universe still loves you. Can I get an amen in that? That it's not about what you, and, and here's our culture. If you meet somebody, what's the first question out of your mouth after what's your name? What do you do? What do you do? Because if you don't do, what, what would happen if you go, nothing? <laughs> Man, I just sit around and do nothing. They go, loser. <laughs> we, we are bent on do. The, 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 there's some, and God's word says it's not about the things that you get. It's not about what you do. Can, can I just pull back the curtain a little bit? I did something bad to myself early on. I, I decided that, that my value, even as a, as a young man, my value was all about performance. That somehow I got it in my mind that if I didn't get straight A's, that I was not a good person. And I remember being in junior high. And I remember taking a test, and, and you can judge me on this if you want, but I'm just going to be an open book. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share this with you. I remember taking a test and being so stressed out. I'm not, and I was a straight-A student, but it wasn't because it came easy for me. All you straight-A students, I didn't even have to study. I mean, I was at my desk for hours a night. I, I, I worked hard to get those A's because, because I thought that's what, what, what made me of value. And I remember taking a test and I remember hearing the answers in my own voice. Okay, that's, that's the answer. And, I was, and then I'd hear a competing answer. And it got to the place where I was drowning myself taking that test and just feeling the stress. And I remember sitting at that desk in junior high, ninth grade, and beginning to weep. And I asked to be excused. And I, and I didn't know where to go. They said, well, where do you want to go? And I, I need to go see the counselor. I'd never been to the counselor before. And I went in and I, and I saw the counselor and they told me that I was stressing. Stop it. <laughs> Great, now I gotta worry about that too. <laughs> and even though he wasn't my principal then, the principal that I was going to have in high school, Don Hallbauer, he was such a good guy. He's a big guy. I mean, bigger than me even now. I mean, when I was in junior high, he was towered over me. He had talked to me a couple times about stress things, and he knew that was part of what was going on in my world. And I remember he grabbed me by the back of the neck, and you went wherever he went when he did that. And he kind of walked me over to a window. He said, Andy, what is that? I thought, oh, no, it's another test. What, what, what I got to do? I go, what? He goes, just what is that? I go, the sun? He said, yep. It rose this morning. It's going to set tonight. Guess what it's going to do tomorrow? It's going to rise tomorrow. It's going to set tomorrow. And it's just going to keep doing that. No matter what you do, it's going to keep doing that. And it's going to be okay. And that's all he said. There, there was no pithy wisdom after that. There was, there was no connect the dots. He, he just let me know. You know what? It's not about me. The world will go on. It's not about whether I get an A or an F. That life will go on. Can I get an amen in the house? And it's a lesson. Listen, we put pressure on our kids. You better make the team. You better make the grades. We put pressure on us. You had better get that promotion. You had better get to that income level. You had better. And we put so much stress on us. When we reward that, when we talk about it, when we talk it down, guess what we're doing? We're, what are we feeding our families? It's not about what you have. It's not about stuff. It's not about what you do. It's not about performance. Can I get an amen? Third, it is about faith. It's about faith. Now that sounds like a cop out of an answer because it's just a church answer. No, 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 no. Let me take you back to the text. I need you to see this starting in verse 27. What does it say? And which of you by being anxious can add a single hour to the span of his life? I got to tell you that this is awesome because this is teaching us something that we can't get without God changing us from the inside out. That he says, if you worried, and you worried well, you worried with all your might, how much good is your worry going to do? What's the implied answer? Nothing. Won't do anything. 
And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow and neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his glory was arrayed like one of these. In other words, he didn't even dress as good as a flower. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little? O you of little? This is what he's saying. He's saying it's not about stuff. It's not about performance. Quit having such small faith. God loves you. God's taking care of you. God desires to help you. What does it say? Therefore, don't be anxious saying what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear for the Gentiles seek after these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them all. That word anxious. Everybody say anxious. I believe if we could get this figured out in our church, we'd be the most popular church on the planet. If we could get everybody to figure out how to quit being anxious, look at somebody next to you and say, quit being anxious. Go ahead and tell them. If we could figure this out, we live in an anxious, worried, just fretful society. We're always constantly bothered by something. And and let me tell you what the word anxious actually means. It means to worry or be burdened by or to meditate upon. Some of you didn't think you could meditate. You thought that's a really holistic new age. Oh, no. Guess what? If you can worry, you know how to meditate. (laughs) This is meditating. The bills. (laughs) I found a spot on my left eye. (laughs) Oh, I watched the news. <laughs> and you see what scripture teaches? It says, stop that. Knock it off. Not just knock it off. Knock it off because you have a heavenly father and he knows. Everybody say, he knows. He knows. The heavenly father knows what you need. He knows who you are. And, and if we believe there is a God and he is all powerful and all loving and all knowing, then you have to stand by this. He knows. My kids know I love them. My kids know I'll do anything for them. And yet it's amazing to me when they really want something, how often they feel the need to remind me. Hey, dad, you remember that? You remember that? I just want to bring it up one more time. They'll send me a little text. Hey, doesn't that look? I know you want that. I know, I know, I know. Everybody say, I know. When we know something, we know it. Here's what scripture teaches. We're worried about so many things. You have a heavenly father and he knows. Here's the issue. If we know we have a good God and we know he knows our needs, then we have to have great faith, not little faith, great faith. To believe he'll give us what we need when the time is right. And when we have that kind of faith, faith changes things. I'm going to say that again. You fake an amen. Faith changes things. Let me tell you why. There's a family in our church this last week. And they've been celebrating. They weren't with us on Easter because they got a call. Full grown adult son was in need of a kidney. He'd been in need for several years. And um, they got the call that they found a match. It was a rare match. Ran up to Kansas City and. And he had a new kidney installed. Is it installed? Is that the word that you use? Yeah. Whatever. He had dropped in. I don't know. New transmission, whatever. Uh, gave him a new kidney. And, I, and I've been in contact with that family this week, several times, and this last week. I was talking to dad. And dad made a statement. Now, I, some of you might be a little offended by this, but you just need to hear it I'm t- for a reason. Ready? Are you ready for this? After they put the kidney in, he was so excited. He goes, we've been getting about two quarts of golden stuff an hour. I'm going to let that sink in for just a second right there. He says, we've been getting about two quarts of golden stuff an hour. Now, in all of my years, I have never referred to that as the golden stuff. (laughs) Can I get an amen? But when you're in that position, when you are in that need, when you are waiting for that miracle, that becomes the golden stuff. It changes. It has a new meaning and a new value. And here's what happens. When you have faith, even when you don't have the clothes you wish you had, you have faith to know, but my God knows exactly what I need. Even when you're eating hot dogs and you wish you had a steak, here's what faith does. I know who my God is. He knows my needs. The reality is you can chase all day long. I need more stuff and get deeper in debt and say, I need to perform more and get more and more worn out with nothing left for what God wants you to have. But if you can say, I don't need to choose that. I don't need to pursue that. I'm going to follow God. I'm going to increase my faith. I'm going to believe that my God knows what I need. My God knows how to provide. And in that moment, we begin to value things and we start feeding on what is going to feed your family and grow their faith. Does that make sense? Next. It's not about 
things. It's not about performance. It is about faith. And it is about God first. Verse 33. It's about God first. But seek first. Everybody say first. first. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added as well. You know, this, this is great. Because I like simple. Does anybody else like simple? I like simple. If you're a follower of Christ, are you ready for this? Here's what you got to do. God first. And everything else falls in the line. I got to work on my marriage. I got to read a book on parenting. I got no, Stop. You follow God as hard as you can. And here's what scripture teaches. He'll begin to transform your family. He'll take care of your career. The God of the universe makes you this promise. You seek first him. Everybody say first. It's amazing. When, you, when you're really focused on one thing, it's amazing what happens. Have you ever eaten at a restaurant called Raising Cane? Anybody ever heard of Raising Cane? They're not popular, and I've got a couple who've been there. Raising Cane's amazing. Uh, we ate there on a trip. One of our uh, staffers at Cross, uh, here at Cross Point, Eric Franklin, he said, hey, there's this restaurant called Raising Cane. Let's, uh, let's go eat there. I'm like, sounds biblical. Let's go eat ra- at Raising Cane. I said, um, I just need to grab a salad. He goes, well, you can't get that there. Okay. Well, I'll just get, you know, some steak, you know, some simple meat. He goes, can't get that either. I said, well, what can you get? He goes, you can get chicken strips. And he goes, that's it. I go, no, no, no. You're telling me there's a restaurant that's nothing but chicken strips. He says, yep, they're really good too. Well, they better be. <laughs> and I honestly, I thought, well, he's, he's off. You know what I mean? They, they, there, there can't be a restaurant that only offers chicken strips. You would not believe what their menu looked like. You got in there? You can get the three-strip basket or the four-strip basket or a 20-piece uh, family platter, and then you can add some on. And I started looking. They didn't, even put le- they didn't even put the chicken strips on lettuce so you could fake a salad. You know what I'm talking about? They, they did one thing, and, and I was kind of mad about it. You ever been mad about something stupid like that? I'm like, I came in here, and I'm mad that this is all I can order. So I can get a three-piece or a four-piece basket or something else, and I was so mad. I wanted a four-piece, but I didn't want to conform, so I ordered a three-piece and just added one. That's what I did. <laughs> Now, here's what's really sad. Are you ready for this? Best stinking chicken strips I've ever had in my life. So good. And I got to thinking, you want to know why? They only do one thing. I said, can I get a burger? No. You want a chicken strip? Can I get a steak? Nope. You want a chicken strip? Can I get some cereal? Nope. You can get a chicken strip. That's what you can get right there. One thing. Everybody say one thing. Here's, here's the simplicity of the gospel. The God of the universe loves you so much. He called us sheep because sheep aren't bright, right? <laughs> he said, just follow me. Just follow me. And if we will follow him, if we will seek God, there you got it. If we will seek God, now the problem is in our families, we're feeding our families, seek God and. Seek God with. Seek God first. Last one. And it is all about focusing on today. It's about focusing on today. This is the best news I have for you. Look at verse 34. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for today is its own trouble. Everybody say trouble. No, say it right. Everybody say trouble, trouble. Trouble, trouble. The word trouble is best defined this way, badness. You ever just had a badness kind of day? It says sufficient for today is today, because it's got enough badness in it already. In other words, this is so freeing. God not only says, you don't have to focus on a thousand things, you just follow me, and here's all you have to do today. Just today. Isn't that good news? You don't have to have a five-year plan. You you don't have, you've got, when we went camping this last week, I don't know if you've ever seen a a trailer camper. We we pulled the trailer camper out, we got it unhooked, and and then we're trying to move it and set it up like this, and and I did not realize how important this piece was, but at the very front of the trailer, you have this little crank that the the little foot goes down and holds it up, and and, and I'm I'm trying to unhook some stuff, and and, and Noah was pulling the crank, and all of a sudden it stopped, I said, keep going, bud, and he goes, Dad. I said, keep going. He said, Dad. I said, son, keep going. I looked up at him, and he's holding the crank. It came out. It it was out. And I said, well, put it. This is how dumb I was. Put it back in. He's like, and it doesn't go back in. There was this moment of fear. I'm like, well, I just put it back in there. And I thought, maybe it'll catch. It doesn't work like that. And I'm there. And all of a sudden, I'm thinking, well, we need a new one of these. But it's Sunday night. And we're 50 miles from any place. And and I can't do this. And I can't do that. And and I started thinking about, I got to go to the store. We got to get one of these. and got to make sure it fits. And I had to stop. All that's for tomorrow. 
Tonight, I got to get my truck jack out. I got one thing to do tonight. Everybody say tonight. Do you know what we get caught up in? We get so worried and anxious because we're, I, I got to get a 10-year plan. You got to do this today so that tomorrow does this. God has a great plan. This is so awesome. If we will just listen to him, seek first him and just worry about today. Do you know what the most common word in the New Testament is for your relationship with God? Your most common word? Walk. Walk. Keep in step. Walk. Do you know what it says in the Old Testament? Micah 6, 1, 8. To love mercy, to act justly, and to walk humbly with your God. Just walk with him. God doesn't say take a 10-mile hike and get it done. You know what he says? Walk with me. He didn't say you need to achieve this level. You need to earn this. No, he says walk with me. And do you know what you need to teach your families? Do you know what you need to value in your families? Here it is. Seek first out of everything else. You want to do great in school? Awesome. Seek first, God. You want to be a great athlete? Fantastic. Seek first, God. You want to do really well on the job and climb the corporate ladder? That's awesome. Seek first, God. And how are you going to do that? You don't need a 12-month plan. You don't need a six-year proposal. Today. Today. You walk with God. You be obedient today. And then you find out what he wants you. Because sufficient for today is the badness that has in it. That's it. You just work on today. And all God's people said. What are you feeding your families? As you step back and you look, don't pour into them what the world says is important. Get that poison out the fridge. Seek first his kingdom and walk with him. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be in your word. And I pray that as we uh, come towards the end of this time of worship, that you would be honored by the fact that we are desiring to line our homes up and our lives up with you. And we pray right now that in this moment, you would give us the grace to be able to make some steps, that we don't have to fix everything overnight just to walk with you, that we don't have to come up with an archetypal plan that will fix everything in our home. We just need to walk with you. God, let the priority of every cross pointer within the sound of my voice be this, that God, we would seek you first. We would seek you first. And in that, you would lead us. It's in Christ's name we pray.